Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the first lunch and learn session of UTA's College of College of Business uh, Lunch and Learn series of Business Week 2022. Uh, this session is being recorded just for your information. Uh, obviously, you know, events like this uh, take a, a bunch of uh, preparation and uh, planning, and we're indebted to the work of the uh, UTA College of Business Dean's Office, especially Mary Beth Finley, uh, for all the work that, that she and others uh, have put into planning this wonderful panel. Uh, and I hope you're looking forward to it as much as I am. Uh, my name is Tom Gresa. I work in the management department here at UTA, uh, teach courses in, uh, in human resources and, uh, and management theory, uh, and work closely with our, with our graduate program in HR. Uh, today, we have an amazing panel discussion for you uh, with the topic of the great reprioritization and changing human resources. Uh, we have two great panelists with us. Uh, first is Darren George. Uh, Darren is a managing partner from Mackenzie Easton. Darren is a thought leader and expert in the talent industry, having spent 18 years focusing on organization culture, talent acquisition, talent development, organizational leadership, and organization change. Second is Luella Jernberg. Uh, Luella is a talent acquisition manager for Enterprise Holdings in the DFW area. She started her HR journey uh, at Enterprise Holdings as a management trainee 12 years ago. Uh, and I know we have a number of our uh, number of our UTA students who are currently in that very same program. Uh, two years ago, Luella uh, was promoted to the regional talent acquisition manager for Enterprise. Uh, Luella has lived in many countries. I learned just a few minutes ago she was born in Japan, uh, and she loves the challenge and, and loves working with people. Uh, so our hope today uh, is that uh, you know that you'll be able to have some meaningful takeaways from this panel. Uh, you'll be able to come away with you know maybe an innovative idea, a fresh perspective, uh, or maybe a new business strategy that you can apply uh, to be more successful in your professional life, or or maybe even in your career search. The format for our panel today uh, is, you know, a typical, uh, typical, for, uh, typical format for a panel. Uh, I'll have a few questions for the panelists that'll kind of hopefully highlight some of the high-level themes and ideas uh, related to the topic, and then we'll open it up to questions from you. Uh, you can uh, you can ask questions either through the uh, the chat function or by uh, by raising your hand or virtually raising your hand, uh, uh, and then we'll wrap up uh, wrap up by one o'clock. Uh, and so uh, my first first question is uh, simply, you know, what is this great reprioritization that we're hearing about uh, and how did it come to be? So, Darren, why don't you start us off? Tell us what this great reprioritization is. So I think you've heard, I mean, everybody's heard of the great resignation and now people are kind of switching to the great reprioritization. Um, really, what this is, is, a you know, during COVID, nobody moved right nobody wanted to uh quit um because they were afraid right and and we have a natural there, there's a natural cycle where people are always right um a certain amount of people are going to be looking um actively and then there's a certain amount of people that are uh that are going to be recruited away because they're not actually looking for passive right passive candidates um the great reprioritization, what, what essentially happened was you had this huge um, buildup of demand that nobody was moving because everybody was afraid to. With the added, um, the, there was a little bit of an added, you know, uh, uh, that was not part of a normal cycle where so many people during COVID said, you know, I'm sitting at home and um, I'm hanging out with my family and, and I don't really like what I'm doing. So uh, I, I'm going to quit my job and I'm going to move to Hawaii, right? So there's a percentage of that that, I mean, we've seen throughout the market, right? Anecdotally, and, you know, you're starting to see some of those from a statistical standpoint. But a lot of it is literally just normal cycle that all happen at once because of pent up demand. Um, and so, and and I think that a lot of people during COVID, it forced it it forced them to go. Am I happy? I, I may like what I'm doing, right? Because you again, you had that subset, which I think is not part of the normal cycle, that said, I 
don't like what I'm doing. So I'm literally going to quit and go start a business or do something totally different. But you also had a subset that is not part of the normal cycle that looked at it because of re working remotely or whatever that said, I don't know if I like where I'm working at anymore. I don't feel like they take care of me or their values don't sit with what I really, you know, the company I want to be a part of. So I think you had more of a demand that way. But I, I think the great resignation was just a misnomer because again, you had people that was just pin up man that were actually all doing it once where they were moving to, you know, re being recruited or moving for better jobs, more money or a better situation. So that's I mean, essentially in a nutshell, nutshell what we're what I think we're dealing with for the past six months. Great, thanks. Luella, would you like to add to that? I think, yeah, I think you answered it really well. And just to add, I think it's really opened our eyes as business owners and hiring managers to really look closely at how our employees see our company and what does the future look like. Um, you know, it for learning and development and is is just a priority. And as much as onboarding procedures and training, I think that those things are so important really now more than ever. I mean, I think they were always important, but that first few months at a company is everything. I mean, that really sets the tone for your future. Um, you have to make sure that your training is very specific. Um, and not just in the beginning of your career, but throughout your all of your development as you, especially for our company, as you continue to get promoted and move your way forward, um, you need to see training in every single position. So, you know, what does that look like um, in a career with that company? I think that that is very important. So really digging in deep and restructuring any onboarding procedures or training that your company has. I think a lot of companies have done that. Um, and then also just knowing that flexibility is really nice and something that's important to our employees, but also keeping that fine line between flexibility and allowing your employees to do what's important to them, but also having a structure. I think that, you know, we've also seen that employees do like to have a structure, have set goals and expectations to know how they can achieve their goals and what does that time frame look like. So you have to really be creative and keep your um, eyes open to new ideas, not just from your peers, but from your employees too. So I would say those few things have really been top of mind. Thank you. So, uh, well, you're a talent acquisition manager. And so for those who aren't familiar with that term, that means you're kind of a boss recruiter, right? You're, you're the, one of the chief recruiters uh, for enterprise. So tell me, how, how is this great reprioritization impacted companies abilities to recruit the most qualified uh, recruit the most qualified job candidates what are you doing about it what are some other companies doing about it what are some things that that my students who might want to be recruiters in the near future what kind of things should should they be thinking about as they're you know as they're coming into the job market during this great reprioritization yeah, I think it's really important to look at why employees are considering leaving, not whether or not they are, because that will help uncover, you know, the real factors of what's important to your people. So um, just listening to our employees and what they'd like. So for example, our company, we have opened in the last two years a lot more hybrid positions or fully remote work positions to allow um, for some employees who just can't come to work every single day because they have families or kids that they need to take care of. And that has shifted a lot in the last two years with COVID and all the challenges that they're facing. So we want to make sure that our employees know that they don't need to leave our company to find something different. We have several opportunities across all business lines um, to make sure that they're taken care of. So opening those positions uh, and specifically to hiring. Uh, in the last two years, what we've done was we have a center of excellence, and that's a fully remote work um, center of excellence that they are at home and they're helping to recruit for cold calls. So searching on LinkedIn and Indeed and all of those sources to find candidates for us in the future, as well as all of our core staffing. So auto detailers and drivers uh, that primarily support our business operations and our airports are our largest operations. So they help 
recruit for um, those major work groups. So that has that has helped a lot, and that also has allowed the talent acquisition managers to be out in the field. Um, recruiting for employee referrals, also on college campuses, attending a lot more events. So it really, really helps even out um, everything that we do. So that's specifically what we've done. Also, we have listened about hours. We went from a full time 48 hour work week for our management trainees down to 45. Uh, actually here in Dallas, Fort Worth, we were the first to pilot that across the company. So that was pretty awesome. And uh, yeah, just making sure that we're staying competitive in the market with pay as well across all job groups too. So that's what we've specifically done. Darren? Yes, yeah, so we've seen across, um, you know, most, most of the stuff that we do is all executive level, but we've seen across the market, uh, one, it's hard to keep up with the compensation. Like, I mean, from across, I mean, from lower level, you know, entry level positions to executives, um, it's hard to keep pace with what everything that's happened in the market. People are trying to keep their own. So, you know, everybody's looking internally, like, is there equity pay there as well as looking at, you know, what, but at some point, right, the, the market caps out. So it has been difficult to recruit because one, there's a pent up demand. So there's a lot of people that are leaving, but, you know, making sure that you're finding a quality person that's a good fit is different than just, you know, bringing people on. Um, so, you know, we've seen from, you know, it, it has, it, it's made it more difficult to recruit across the market, I think right now, um, because one, I, I think employers are having to learn, you have to be more flexible, but at the same time, you know, most employers, I mean, the, I think the statistics, 60% of all jobs, cannot be done remotely, right? So um, trying to figure out how do employers focus on what employees want, right? That engagement, making sure that you're 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 bringing to the table, um, whether it's remote work, whether it's hybrid, but also like you have to also like, you know, a bus driver can't work remotely, right? So how do we take and go and find, um, you know, and like, for instance, that's a great like across the nation, bus drivers got recruited to go to Amazon or completely different. So now there's literally across the nation, it's just not enough bus drivers. So how do you go out and recruit, right? For a, a position that is usually people don't go, yeah, that's what I want to do is be a bus driver, right? Um, and so trying to think outside the box, how do we fill those positions in a way that's, because I mean, most of the time for every one you're recruiting, you're oftentimes losing two and it's a, it's just been a losing fight. So we've done a lot of work where we go in and are actually working with clients to actually go, okay, one, how do you need to redo your process so you can move people through faster, hire the right people so they're gonna stay. And I think, you know, speaking um, to, you know, what you said, I think recruitment actually happens internally first because you want to keep your people like keeping your best people is like i mean that is your best return on investment versus having to go out and recruit someone to come because unless it's an entry level position and then you've you've got people in there you know having people that are already in the job and know how to do it because there's always a ramp up i don't know if that answers the question or not but yeah well, let me ask a little bit of, of a follow up question since uh, since both of y'all mentioned, uh, you know, kind of the, the normalization of remote work and, and hybrid work. Lots of companies kind of had uh, kind of had this temporary remote work or, or temporary hybrid work uh, during the pandemic. And I, I heard a story recently about, you know, at least one recruiter who when she heard about uh, about companies announcing the end of their temporary remote work, temporary work at home uh, policy, she would jump on that and use that as an opportunity to try to steal their employees uh, because she was at a company that that had, you know, that had taken their temporary remote and, and made it a permanent remote. Is that something that that's common? I mean, is that kind of a, a rec new recruiting tool? Is it something that you sell? So I, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to go a little higher level on this. Um, so during COVID, you saw huge swaths of companies go remote and a lot of companies have left either 
permanent. I mean, there are companies now that literally they let go of their offices and everybody's remote. And I think some companies can do that. I think you're going to find um, there is going right. It's a pendulum, and the pendulum is swung really far this way, where um, a lot of people, a lot of companies are like, "Oh, we're, everybody wants remote," and that's not actually true. There's a lot of there's a lot of employees who want the interaction and collaboration. And I think you're also going to have a swing back to the middle. I mean, look, remote or hybrid flexibility, it's here to stay. And I think great companies will recognize that there can be some flexibility in almost every position. But I think there's going to be pendulum swing back. And we're telling this to all of our clients that we do consulting on is that um, you can't develop leaders in your company if they're fully remote. It's, I mean, it is, it is almost impossible, right? Uh, your ROI is going to go down if everyone is remote because all people can be as individual, like individual contributors. It's very hard to develop a leader that knows how to do, have the breadth and depth from a purely remote standpoint. So I think there are companies, so, and then, you know, drill that back down to more of your question on, on you know, recruiting. Uh, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's uh, i mean recruiters are always looking for a, a way to to go and and you know i mean whether it's external or internal right um you're always looking for the best way to go out and find you know and pick somebody that's really great off but i think it's a um i think it's just like the great resignation i think that's probably overblown um and it's probably somewhere in the middle that you know the majority of people they actually want some sort of hybrid where they're going to be in office or around coworkers. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that too. It, it's about to develop a leader. You have to be in the business around others to get that coaching, training, and development. Uh, and in our business, you know, it's a customer facing role. You're out in the branches and you're helping customers. So yes, I've seen and talked to a lot of candidates who are just really sick of being at home and want that interaction because maybe they're not getting it at home and they just want to be around people. So I couldn't agree more. That's so important. And even in our business as department leaders here at our administrative office, I mean, I personally can't sit at home and understand what's going on in our business. You have, you miss out on that constant communication that you have with your regional vice president, your GM, your HR manager, your risk manager. I mean, there's so many different levels of our business that you won't get from just sitting at home and things change constantly. It's so fast paced. So you have to be ready for that and be able to quickly adjust. And you get that from being in the office and talking to your coworkers. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, Darren, you, you tried to get us into uh, talking about retention uh, a little bit earlier. Let's let's take on retention uh, head on. Uh, so, how how has this reprioritization uh, impacted uh, companies, including maybe some of your clients' uh, abilities to retain their most qualified employees? And and what are companies doing about it? What are you advising them to do about it? What are you advising them not to do about it? Yeah. Um, so, I think it's forced companies to look at like what is what's actually proven to work to retain our employees right um and it's actually very simple <laughs> most organizations do a really poor job of it right so i mean there's been a lot of research that's gone into what do employees want right and 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 I, let me preface this with we have moved from um you know the 50s and 60s where uh people stayed with organizations for 30 years and, you know, I talked to, to older CEOs are like, oh, you know, this younger generation, they're always on the move. You know, they don't stay with a the company. There's no loyalty. And, you know, every generation is, is different, but that's not the problem. Organizations change faster than they did 30, 40 years ago. Organizations change so fast these days that oftentimes they change faster than people can. So oftentimes it's not that the person is no longer like they're just up and looking it's that they're no longer a good fit for the company anymore because the company has changed technology everything makes us move so much faster from an organizational standpoint now i think it has forced companies though to go okay but what do we need to do because it costs so much to recruit it costs so much to train and get someone ramped up and i don't care if it's entry level to executive it takes a year to get someone fully you know operational in a role 
So I think it's forced people to take a look at like, what do you need to do? Well, there's tons of research that shows. One, employees, they want to know what the path is. You know, and it doesn't matter if it's the path to president or path to a recruiter. They want to know what the path is. It doesn't mean that they can get there, but they want to know what the path is. Two, they want to know that they can constantly grow. Okay. And so, you know, it, it's it really goes back to this culture thing, right? There is a set culture of like very specific building blocks that people want to be a part of, right? And so people they're forced to look at okay one like you know um i mean dei is the big thing now well it's because people want there to be an equitable level playing field okay two they want to know what's the path if i want to do this how can i get there and then what are the resources that the company is willing to invest in me to get there um you know one of the things that we sit down and talk to companies about like you have to have those things there it doesn't mean that you invest in everybody equally because that doesn't make sense from a financial standpoint so you need to act but you know that's another thing right transparency employees want to know where they stand if you don't see them as a high potential right now let them know right and they 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 recognize that and go okay now i know what i need to do to get there or i need to go to an organization that is going to be a better, better, better fit for my resource and skill set where I'm going to be viewed as a high potential. So. Thank you. Uh, Hopefully so that Luella, answers it. Absolutely. So Luella, you're you're a recruiter, but obviously you care about retention as well. You, you have your own team that, that you care about and you care about uh, retention across uh, across enterprise. Tell us a little bit about uh, about how you all are thinking about retention. Yeah, that that's super important because, you know, as you spend so much time to find these candidates and something that Darren said was quality over quantity, that's so important. Uh, I know so many companies need great talent right now, but you can never jeopardize the quality because you spend so much time training and developing them. And especially with our company, when you promote within and we only hire externally for that position and it's designed to move your career forward and do it quickly, you have to make sure that you are hiring candidates who want to get promoted and want to be successful and have that drive and ambition uh, to do that. So training and development is everything. And, you know, why waste the candidates time, my time, our team, our trainers, our HR team, all of everyone's time uh, to see that person go. So quality is everything. And, you know, I think that things that have seemed a lot more important now than ever are career growth, uh, financial stability, knowing that there is structure and a path. And just like he said, I mean, it's, what does that look like? I mean, so many companies talk about growth opportunity, of course, because everyone wants it, but what does that specifically look like and how do I get there? And along the way, who's helping coach, train and mentor me to get there? What does that timeline look like? And once I achieve that, then what's next for me? So I think all of those things are very important and taking care of your families and not just looking at right now, what's good for me right now, but what's good for me and my family in the future and 10 years down the road. So looking at the bigger picture and for our company, not just explaining, you know, what the role is, but what what is the big picture behind the why and everything that we do? I think that that's so important because candidates, I can tell you, just speaking to them every single day, it's they want to work for a company that has a great culture and that they're happy, um, but they also have to find that fine line of you do have to put in the hard work to get there and uh, see those results. So. I think that that's all very, very important. And you know what your company is doing to help in the communities, not just on a large scale, but what are you doing here in our small local uh, communities to help your community? So all of those things, not just talk, but what are you actually doing? You have to be able to, to say to your candidates. So I'm gonna piggyback on something that Luella said. Like we now, when we go in and we're talking to, to, to clients, it's it's looking at the employee more holistically it is no longer like what do you do for me the 40 hours you're here or 48 or 50 or 60 or whatever it is right we want to look at you like what are your aspirations long term and if that doesn't involve being an enterprise hey that's great 
right? 10 years down the road, that's okay. Like, and so we want to understand, look at the holistically, like, where do you want to go? You want to be president of the United States? Fantastic. <laughs> How can we help you get there? Right. Yes. Um, and, and I think so many organizations have, have, they got, they got, they lost that because they look at the cog and forget that, like, I mean, if you look at it holistically, employees see that and they buy in and it, and it changes things. So, uh, Darren, you mentioned that the idea of, of using the career path or, or career ladder in retention. Uh, Luella, you mentioned training and development. When, when I heard both of y'all talk about those things, it, it sounded like you were talking about individualized plans of, of career development and training and development. That seems like a, a very resource intensive uh, activity for managers and, and for HR professionals. Can you tell me a little bit about, about how you operationalize that and, and how you come up with the resources to, to make that happen on an individualized basis? It doesn't have to be resource intense. You can have a program that literally it's simple and it, it the onus is on the employee, right? Hey, here's all the resources and 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 then you back it up with the accountability of like, hey, every year, every quarter and every year, we're going to look at like, hey, what's your growth? Like, how are we doing? And where are we failing to be able to support you, right? So it's that two-way street. Um, yes, it does It does cost, but the payoff in the ROI is Great. significant because, so think about it, and this is where we tell our, talk to our clients, and I'm sorry, because I don't want to dominate, the, but like if you are, if you are taking every employee and growing them five to 10% extra every year by focusing on growth over five years, they now can do the work of one and a half employees because of the growth. And the, you know, because it doesn't mean that everybody grows and moves up to new, higher, bigger roles. It may be growing within their role. And so, but the ROI on it is, is 10x of what you actually put into your your learning and development program if you do it right yeah i mean i couldn't agree more uh, majority of our training is hands-on at the branches learning by doing and then we couple it with training with our talent team uh here at our uh, regional headquarters so they get the classroom training too and the why behind the things that we do but um as darren said along your career i mean you have monthly meetings with your branch managers and area managers to sit down and go over you know where where are you at what do you need from me how can i help you get there and constantly coaching um to help that person become more successful so it's not you don't wait you don't let a month pass for you to recognize that they need a little bit more help in a certain category you're, you're constantly following up and making sure that they're getting everything that we promised them they would when they start with us uh, and then just a career with promotional opportunities you're challenged every single day when you work with customers there's different situations that come up that make you think on your feet and really challenge you and when you're in an environment where you're striving to be excellent and not just great, that really pushes you um, to get out of your comfort zone and achieve things that you maybe thought you couldn't. And once you start doing it, you encourage those around you to do the same. And that's what creates a culture of excellence and everyone performing at a high level. So I think that constantly being challenged and learning um is a great feeling because it feels like you're part of something and you're accomplishing new things and p everyone likes to win and be successful so i think when you don't see that you start losing connection with why you're there so it's so important to stay on top of that all throughout your entire career <clears throat> very helpful thanks uh so you know if you if you were to to talk with uh, you know with one of our students here in the college of, of business at uh, at uta and you know uta is as a comprehensive uh, college of business we've got undergrad programs in finance and accounting and management and marketing and, and and all the typical business disciplines mba students uh graduate students in hr and finance and in economics and everything you know if you were to to share with them uh Many, by the way, many, probably most of them who are on the job market right now today, uh, if you were to share uh, with them how they could, you know, differentiate themselves, how they could uh, better sell themselves uh, to recruiters and to hiring managers, what kind of work should they be doing to 
you know, to prepare for their search processes and, and to prepare for the for the beginnings of their careers. Uh, Luella, why don't you start? Make sure that you align uh, with the company's mission and values. I think that we talked a lot about that already. I think that that's very important. Uh, also, do your research before you click apply. Use Glassdoor or LinkedIn. There's so many different sources out there that you can use to do your research. Do it before you apply. Um, also, only apply to jobs that you truly desire and fill out the application in full. I think it, you know, don't just go online and apply to several different jobs. Take a moment to do your research and really apply uh, to the ones that you truly love and want to be part of their company. Also, uh, we talked about this too, but be open to in-person work um, because, you know, I really think that that's going to come back. And again, if you want, if you see yourself as a leader and you want that growth potential and learning um, and communication and interaction with others, you have to be open to that. I also encourage um, just being open to relocation. You never know what opportunities that can bring for you. Uh, you know, our company's international, so the more open you are, I mean, the sky's the limit. So really, really be open to that and uh, take risks. I think, uh, you know, especially in this world, it, it sometimes it might seem scary, but the outcome um, could be fantastic for you and your family and what you want in a future. So really think about that. It might be a small risk to take, but uh, a, a great outcome. So, and then I would also say, you know, be open to jobs outside your field. Yes, you might apply for the management trainee program and work your way up. And then you're a branch manager and you see that you might have interest in HR or risk department or business management. We have so many different business lines that you can be successful in because everyone here started out entry level and you work your way up. So um, just be open. And then I know we, we mentioned this too, but really lastly, be willing to work. Um, we want you to enjoy coming to work, but you also have to put in the effort when you come to work. So um, that's that's what I would say. Darren? Those are all great. Yeah, so, um, you know, I think people coming out of college, the biggest thing is they, I mean, you know, most of the time they're not sure what they want to do, right? Um, and And I think we do a really poor uh job of helping people figure out what where their gifts are and where they're going to be happy so but but here's what i'd say right just make sure you do something that you're going to be happy doing it right um and so uh, and, and you can find a career in anything right i mean most of the time when we get out like i mean i had no clue when i graduated with a bba from uta that i would end up doing HR consulting and, and you know, going to get my master's in industrial and organizational psychology. Like, yeah, I mean, that's, it was, you know, but you can make a great career out of something as long as you find that, that you know, you do something that you're, you're, you're happy and you like doing. Uh, second thing I'd say is you are, com we, we live in such a globally connected community now. So you aren't, competing with people in Arlington or Dallas or Fort Worth in the newspaper, you know, I mean, most people graduate and now don't realize that that's where you used to go to get, you know, jobs, right? You'd go look at the jobs in the, the classifieds. Um, you know, it, you compete now literally on an international uh, scale when you are applying for a job. And that literally means that you have so much more competition when it comes to getting a job that you want. And so, what I uh, often, you know, when I, I talk to to students and I actually do some stuff where we we talk to uh, people who are out of a work, you know, and and you know executives that are looking for work, and I'm like, here's the thing, you have to stand out. And I find that most resumes are so generic. Um, one, I mean, in you know, as a as a recruiter and and you know. Uh, we look at it as 90% of it is lies anyways, right? I mean, you know, it's like, it's all embellishment, but but you need to stand out. And so what I always talk about is the very first thing that should be in your resume, right? Below your, your name and your contact info is a, a one to two, at most three sentence 
that talks about who you are, right? And where you're going to be a, a fit. Um, and, and this is even for executives, right? Because uh, look, you, you can tell me I was CEO of a mid-market manufacturing firm. That's great. Then tell me what type of CEO you are. You know, you could be a growth uh, CEO. You could be a turnaround CEO. You could be a process-oriented CEO. And so, like, really identifying like who you are and what what drives you, what motivates you, um, should be one of the first things in your resume, so that they can go. It just it separates you and it makes you stand out versus all the other resumes they're looking at of like, wow, this person knows who they are. And wow, I think they'd be a really good fit for our group. And so just do that, stand out that way by by really thinking about like what motivates you, where your fit is and put that in your resume. We have, we've just gotten to where resumes are this, um, it, it, it's a chronological history and it doesn't say anything about who we are. and that's not how you get a job, right? I mean, it, it just shows your qualifications. It doesn't show who you are and how you're going to be a fit. And that stands out to hiring managers. So, you know, if if I were a, a 20 something college senior and I, you know, have a resume uh, that's 100% the truth, and I hear Darren say resumes are 90% lies, uh, what I'm thinking is, well, damn, I, I need to start adding some lies to my resume so that I can be on an, an, a level playing field with with all these other liars. Is that, what, is that what I should do? Is that how I should respond to hearing that? No, I, I just think, I mean, you have to take it with a grain of salt, right? Um, one, companies are putting their best foot forward, you know, and there's no perfect company. Uh, every company has dysfunction in it. So it's it's getting past that. There's and and resumes are full of embellishment, you know. I mean, I look at resumes, I'm like, so wait, you were you were single handedly responsible for uh increasing sales four hundred million. I'm like, I just have a hard time believing that, right? So I think you just have to take it with a grain of salt that both people and employers are trying to put their best foot forward. Um, so embellishment happens. Now, again, I think the way you stand out is showing who you are and where you fit versus trying to embellish because, I mean, it, it just doesn't work. Luella, what about, what about from your perspective? is just be clear and concise on your resume. Uh, that brings you to the interview. And then once you're in the interview, you can elaborate on those things. And that's your opportunity to brag about yourself and tell us what made you so su successful and how you achieve the things that are on your resume. So I think the interview is the opportunity to really talk about that. Good, thanks. Well, if it's okay with uh, with y'all, I'd like to go ahead and open it up to some of our other participants and see if they have uh, some questions for y'all. And so uh, you are welcome to uh, submit a, a question or a, or a comment that you have for our panel, uh, either through the chat feature uh, or by raising your hand. Uh, and if for some reason we run out of time, uh, I'll do my best to to corner our panelists uh, afterwards and and get some uh, get some responses to any questions that we didn't didn't get to. Uh, so feel free to jump in either by uh, by raising your hand or by uh, typing a question in the chat. <clears throat> we must have been really good if there's no <laughs> questions. You guys are un unbelievable. Well, let me let me ask another question then while while folks are are finding their keyboards. Uh, so. Uh, T let's talk a little bit about uh, about early career development. You know, for for folks who are kind of at the beginnings of their careers, maybe have that that first job out of college. What what kind of priorities should should they have in terms of their long term career development? How is it that that they can best position themselves early in their careers uh, to to have the most uh, most success and 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 the greatest uh, possible trajectory down the road? setting goals and expectations for themselves first. I mean, of course, we're going to do it for you, but you should have goals for yourself and maybe having one action step that you do every single month to get you closer to that goal. But, 
you know, we're, we're going to train you and develop you and give you all of these things, but we also want to see that um, you take initiative and you do it yourself. Sometimes you're not going to always have your manager right there to, to help you with every single thing that you need. So I really encourage you to find a mentor. Um, it, it doesn't have to be at your branch. It could be anyone in our company. And that's what makes us so unique is that everyone starts out entry level. And so we know what it's like to start in your shoes and, and work your way up. So anyone in our company from here to Chicago to New York, you pick up the phone and call them or email them or set up a Teams call uh, to ask any questions. So I really encourage uh, as a new hire starting your career to find a mentor for someone that you can reach out to you to give you training. Um, but also when you're having a hard day, just someone to talk to to help you through those days. Sure. Uh, be excellent in your role, right? If yeah. you want to, if, if, if you want to, um, if you want to grow into bigger roles and a certain career path, be excellent in what you do. I, I find um, it that is such a rarity these days in that a lot of people, I mean, it's a, um, I had a client the other day say this, uh, you know, they're at, they're at eight to, they're at eight, eight, eight and skate, right? So it's like, um, there, there's no motivation. There's no desire to like make sure that they are doing it well and you know and and i think the days of like doing it well means you have to be so committed that you're you know working 68 hours a, a week but having that like i want to do it i want to do it well um and and having some pride in that uh, you'll go so far i mean like you know um right. and that's where i think i go back to do something you you are going to be happy and you love even if you know what your career is going to be like if you, you will figure that out and and as long as you're doing something that you love right then you you will do it well and you will be and, and so that's the thing right you're first in your career um it doesn't matter just do it well even like i mean i remember when i first started i got out of college went to work for a Japanese company doing sales and everybody's like, you're going to be great at sales. Um, I hated it. I'm not a salesperson. They were like, but you, you can talk to anybody. I'm like that. I realize that does not make me a good salesperson. Right. Um, love consulting. <laughs> I hate sales, but I did it for a year and a half. I did it as hard as I could. And I was like, okay, I've realized this is not for me. But there's a there is a a portion of it that I'm that I like and moved into talent acquisition, right? And and made a career out of, you know, talent acquisition and then learning talent development and and you know all the fun parts of HR, which is you know it's funny. I, I don't know about you. I literally for 18 years somebody was like, so you're in HR, and I'm like, absolutely not. Uh, <laughs> H HR is uh, that stands for human rules, and that is opposite. What do I do, right? Uh, and and at some point in my career, about uh, several years ago, I was like, you know what? I am part HR. I'll I'll admit it. I'm just not your traditional HR person. Yes. That looks like somebody was starting to type a question and they didn't quite finish it. So I, if I'm reading this right, and Mary Beth, please correct me if I'm if I'm not reading it right. I still don't see any see any questions, so I'll just keep keep asking. Uh, one of the um, one of y'all mentioned earlier uh, the the pretty dramatic change we're seeing in in compensation, particularly uh, entry level comp. And you know, I, I work with you know, I work with with a number of our students who are getting their first jobs, and and some of the numbers that they they've shown me, uh, you know, my eyes have popped out of my head, and, and you know, I'm almost going to the dean's office saying, hey, we need to look at Tom's comp here. Um, but so, so tell me, is this is this is this, just, is this an artifact of the broader economic inflation, or is this, or is the the you know the big jump in compensation that we're seeing is is it something different than than that? I think from from what I have seen from the research, um, it, it's a it, you know usually there's not one particular thing. I think it's a it's a a, a, a compounding of a number of different things one inflation is cause inflation is causing some of this but there's also been a number of stagnation at, at especially entry level for the past 
I mean, 20 years, you just haven't seen the increase in in um, in the the compensation. While you've seen, you know, whether it's uh, cost of living, you know, continue to go up. So I think it's a number of things that are happening, as well as you know, because there was such a a, a pent up demand, and all of a sudden everybody was like looking at new jobs all at once. It caused it. It really put more of the the um, power in the employee's hands versus the employer. So you're seeing a little bit of change of dynamics of where the power is because corporations are going, well, we can't keep, you know, we've got to compete. We don't want to lose our people um, and we're not being able to find people at this this level. Now, I and this is just a personal my personal philosophy, I, I think there is there's always a market there that's going to, you know, um, uh, level out and and like we were my I we took our kids to California for spring break last week we have a five six and eight year old and we went to Disneyland for one day because that's literally all that we could afford and then we did Legoland for two days and then just did the beach and different things the rest of the time um, but we went I was at the store while we were there going to get some stuff and they were doing a, a deal to raise the minimum wage to $25 across the board for everyone. I'm like, I, I'm not going to sign it. I'm like, I don't necessarily believe, I believe in there's a market rate that will happen now. But I do think that for the past 20 years, there's been a stagnation of that because of corporations that have had majority of the power and employers are now losing some of that power because so many people have left their jobs at one time that's forcing employers to go, oh, OK, we got to pay more. Um, so I think there's a bit of an equalization that's happening there that's good for the market, but then you have inflation and some things that are also happening that are bad for the market. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, of course, you still need to stay competitive with the market and look at that constantly. Things are always changing and there are multiple factors like you mentioned. Uh, but also, I know a lot of companies were doing signing bonuses and that was a hot topic for so long. Uh, for all new hires, I think it's also really important to look at your current employees like we talked about so many times uh, over this call. But in, instead of paying new hires and you don't know if that candidate's going to stay with your company or not, why don't we uh, pay out our current employees for and have different incentives for them or employee referral bonuses and and looking at increasing that and doing more innovative, creative ideas on what we can offer our employees and make sure that we're taking care of them um, instead of looking at what we can do just for a short period of time, which we don't know if we'll have a long term investment. Very good. It uh, looks like we do have a question. Uh, Aaron Montez, why don't you jump in here and, and ask your question? Hello. Um, so I actually asked Dr. Grossa this question a few months ago. And I kind of wanted to hear y'all's input as well. Um, would you say you need like a certain personality to work in talent acquisition or for certain HR roles? Or do you think like any kind of personality can kind of fit in in that role or any of those roles? You want me to in jump in or you, you, like. want to, you want to go first, Luella? <laughs> I can go first. you have to want to do that type of job. So again, talk, talking about what you love, you have to have a passion for it. And I think with both HR and um, TA, working with people, you have to love people. You have to care for people. You have to have a, a invested interest to make sure that the people that you bring onto your team or other teams will become successful that you are just as important of a factor in that that employee's life um, as anything. I mean, when we offer uh, opportunity to a candidate, I mean, we're changing that person's life. Uh, it, it's you, you don't really look at it on such a large scale like that. But, you know, I always tell my employees, like, I'm here with you, not just to bring you on to our team, but through your entire career, whatever you need. Uh, you know, we're experts in interviewing. So as you continue to get promoted, we do that internally. We sit down and we do role plays on interviewing and, and how to be successful. And just as a mentor in their career. Um, you know, I think that, you, again, you just have to have an interest in making sure that that person you bring on the team uh, is going to be successful. So any personality type, it just you have to 
love people and um, just have a genuine passion for that. I think it comes down to those two things. Darren? So um, th this is a, I, I, I could totally do a soapbox uh, on this. Um, so no, you don't need to have a certain personality to do any job, right? Um, you know, that's why when I first got out, people were like, oh, you're going to be great in sales because I have a personality that is on the extrovert side, but I can only do it for a certain amount of time. And then like, I'm like, oh, I don't, you know, um, but from a consulting standpoint, it works great, right? Um, and, and, it, and I have a big soapbox is that I find a lot of larger organizations use personality assessments as a way to cut people out and it it is the wrong way to to handle it um you know they have these prototype candidates and it's just not it's not accurate right um you know people would think uh that a salesperson would be an extrovert direct etc some of the best salespeople in the entire world uh throughout history were introverts uh, because they were able to connect with people on a deeper level and just, I mean, be fantastic. So I, I, uh, I, I soundly reject when companies use uh, prototyping as like, oh, don't hire this person because they don't fit the mold. When anybody can do the position, it just goes back to like, you know, like if you're an extreme, extreme, extreme introvert, should you probably be doing cold calling? Probably not, but um, you know. And and here's a here's a great example, right? Um, we have a client that he's a, an assistant city manager, and he is an engineer. And just like with most engineers, extreme introvert, you know. Um, but over the years, he has actually learned the skill set of being able to get up and like do a presentation. And you would never know he was an engineer or an introvert. He gets up and he can light up and all of a sudden, you know, people are like, I mean, and, and just fantastic. And then he gets off stage and then it's like, you know, looking at his own shoes again, whatever. And you're like, wow. Um, <laughs> so no matter what your personality is, you can do the job, right? Uh, it, it's just, are you, is, is it what you love to do? And, and are you happy doing it? And if so, um, then you can do it. Excellent. So I, I don't see another hand or or question out there. So let me let me ask a follow up. So uh, Darren, I, I certainly agree that that using uh, personality typing and that kind of stuff to to exclude folks from from the running is is neither in in applicants' best interest nor in the firm's best interest. But but let me ask you this: Is there? Let me ask both of you all this: Is is there a role for any type of psychometric assessment in the selection employee selection process or in career development you know if if you know if i've got students who are over in our career development center who are using certain psychometric assessments are they are they helpful in the development process or the selection process absolutely so one most personality uh assessments are complete bunk they're not statistically valid really the only one that's statistically valid that's been validated, you know, and it has been validated over and over and over is the big five. Um, and there are certain organizations that have taken the big five and broken that out into various other subsets, but that is the only one that's been validated. Now, um, I, I fundamentally believe that, and it's been proven right through research, that using assessments in the hiring process is a good thing, but you should use it as a data point to back up is that what you're seeing, right? It and, and should not be used as a cutoff. The reason companies use it as like a prototype, like they cut, you know, like part of the hiring application process, you should put in your app, your your application, you know, and then you automatically go to take this personality test, and then you'll get a your a rejection letter right after that <laughs> because they're using it because they're getting so many resumes they're using it as a way to filter out so they don't have to look as many resumes in their ats system i don't agree with it but it's that's why they're doing it because we live in such globally so they'll get resumes i mean they may get three thousand resumes for one job so but for both learning and development um and for uh hiring you should use assessments um and you should use them to see right 
what are your strengths and weaknesses? How can we put you in a place where you're going to be the most successful? Is is it what we're seeing in you know through the interview process? Um, and if not, then there's there's we got to take a look at that. Well. Yeah, I mean, our interview process is very straightforward. We have a phone interview for second and final. The second has you go to the branch, do an observation, really see what a typical day is like. So, you know, I think that's very important for the candidate than just reading a job description and trying to figure out what a day looks like. So going to the branch, seeing the atmosphere, talking to the employees, asking questions to the people that are actually doing the job. But again, very straightforward. And at the end of the day, it just comes to do you want to work in a customer service field where you're interacting with people? And do you want to be in a management role? You just have to really think about all of those things because we hire all majors. And again, we're known for our training program. So we'll train you on how to do the job and run a business. We'll train you on all those things. So it it's really up to you in the end what type of career you want, but anyone can do the job. Good. Well, uh, thank you both so much for for all of the great uh, insights that you've uh, that you've shared with us today. Uh, so, Luella and, and Darren, thank you both very much. Also, a big thank, thank you. you. Also, a big thank you to uh, to Mary Beth in the dean's office for all the good work she did uh, in putting this event together. Uh, I hope that everyone uh, will also check out some of the uh, some of the other Business Week events that are uh, that are well publicized around UTA and around the the College of Business to, to check out all the other great things we have going on this week. Uh, and of course, thanks to the participants for uh, for joining us, uh, especially thanks to Aaron for jumping in and, and asking a question so that I so that I wasn't stuck having to come up with another one. Uh, thanks. I see lots of uh, lots of hand clapping emojis uh, popping up. Uh, so thank you all very much uh, and hope this was hope this was a meaningful event for everyone. Thanks. Thank you thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Mary. She's 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 golden for everything and everyone. She's awesome. <laughs> thanks. Bye. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Will. Thank you both.